Welcome to Entertainment Drive Through. Today's special is Grand Kirkup. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hello, hello, welcome to Entertainment Drive Thru. I'm Anna, with me is my co-host Dan, and today we have a very special guest. He's a British BAFTA and IFMCA nominated composer. He's known for writing soundtracks for Kingdoms of Amalur, The Reckoning, GoldenEye 007, Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, Donkey Kong 64, and so many other amazing games. Actually, the soundtrack to the games, let's just say that. We're super excited. I know Dan is super excited being Banjo-Kazooie Big fan. Let's welcome joining us via Skype is the one, the only Grand Kirkle. Yeah, Woo! welcome to the show. Oh, oh yes, it's me. It's me. Yes, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, get get the tune in there. Get it yeah. in there. It's going pretty well. Thank you. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Well, tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, how did you get started? Uh, well, it's a complete fluke. It was like not intentional at all. I was like playing in, you know, I did a music degree and all the rest of it, you know, I was on trumpet and stuff. And then um, I spent probably 11 years uh, on unemployment mm. after that in playing in lots of rock bands and stuff like that and soul bands and bits and pieces. And then um, it kind of all fell to pieces. And I had a friend called Robin Beanland who um, went to, was working at Rare at the time. He'd been there about a year and a half and said, you're not Grant, you've been on unemployment long enough. Why don't you try and, you know, make a living? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, he said, he, he kind of su- suggested some gear for me to buy. I got like a basic synth and a, an Atari ST. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, why don't you try and write some tunes for games like I'm doing? And I, thought, I thought, well, you know, I've got nothing else to do. I might as well try it, so otherwise I'll just be a camp. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I sort of wrote some tunes and spent probably, I spent probably a year sending cassette tapes to Rare. I sent five t- cassette tapes to Rare, never got a reply. Mm. And then out of the blue, I just got a reply saying, please come for an interview. And I was completely shocked. And mm. uh, I went down t- for the interview and I uh, got the job. Couldn't believe it. So no it, was, it, was, it was my first real it was my first real job at 33. I'd spent so many years on, at college and on, on unemployment. It was a bit strange to actually get up in the morning at the right time, you know. And do you remember so, what the tape, or like what, what music was on the tape? They sent in that yeah, actually I mean, got a response? Yeah, some of it was. Some of it, um, one of the tunes turned up in Donkey Kong 64 eventually. Mm. Yeah, the, sp- the spooky, creepy castle one. Oh, a yeah. Of, <laughs> yeah, a bit of that was on the tape. Um, they the asked me to write sort of, it was a guitar-based fighting piece because at the time they were doing Killer Instinct. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were quite keeping me to play guitar on that, so I had to kind of do one like that. And then I did like a Batman-type piece, which ended up being the one that went to Donkey Kong. <laughs> and then I... I I had to do some kind of um, kind of jolly sort of platform Mario type piece, and I can't think if I used that or not. Mm. I can't think. And maybe I did. I don't know. Maybe not yet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's still time, <laughs> right? You waste not, want not. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to know when did you decide that being a musician was what you wanted to do? You know, it wasn't going to be training a bear to wear a backpack. You wanted to be a musician. That's right. Well, yeah, it was a second choice, and so the bear was first, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it was like when I was a kid, you know, at school. Um, I was, you know, I was I was born in Edinburgh, but I went to school in England. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember them bringing around recorders. I was about four, and they just, you know, said, "Who wants to play a recorder?" And I just put my hand up. I didn't really know what it was, but I just thought, "Well, I'll have a go at that." I don't know why. <laughs> and then I started doing that, and then I think I was six, and they brought around a, a, like a cornet, you know, a, a shrunk down trumpet mm-hmm. in like a shopping basket, and said. Uh, who wants to play this? And I put my hand up first and got that. So I started playing trumpet then. And then at about 11 or 12, I had a friend who played in a little kind of, you know, little school bands, rock band type thing. And he said to me, he said, Grant, you're sort of quite a good musician. Can you come down and keep an eye on the drummer? Because you can't play in time. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I said, sure, come on. So I went, so I went to see them and said, why are you here? Why don't you try playing guitar? So he taught me E minor and A major and then um, chords. And then I started playing guitar from then. I'm kind of self-taught guitar player. So Nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> But like, honestly, you know, I am absolutely useless at everything else. I mean, you know, just as my wife, I'm absolutely, I, I can't do anything apart from write music. Uh. I have no other talents. I have no talents whatsoever. Well, that, I mean, that's, from- that's good then because, you know, then that means you're better at the music. Well, well, I think she probably prefer that I could put, put up the odd shelf here and there, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but I can't manage that either, I'm afraid. I'm completely useless. So uh, I've, I've forfeited everything else sort of worthwhile doing in life to, to do this. Right. And I mean, as a you know, video game composer, how many instruments do you play? 
Well, I'm really only really play. Well, I mean, I do. You know, I can get around quite a few things, but I'm a, right. I'm a really bad pianist, so I'm really bad at that. But um, you know, you know, I was a classically trained trumpet player, so I can do that pretty well. Well, when I used to play, it, I could do it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I'm a pretty good guitar player. I can do all that kind of metal stuff because I'm a big metal fan, you know, still am. Mm-hmm. But, you know, on some of the stuff, I've had to play bass guitar and I've had to play banjo a bit for Banjo-Kazooie and Nuts and Bolts, play, play, play a, little, a real banjo for that. Oh, okay. So, you know, like, yeah, I've had to, I mean, you know, I think you kind of, I could probably pick up quite a few things and play it, but not very well. Right. But yeah. um, guitar and trumpet are my main instruments, really. And I have to ask you, because you brought it up, now you did the music for Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, and Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, correct? Yeah, but on Nuts and Bolts, it was shared with Robin Beanland and Dave Clinic because I was doing Phoebe Pinata at the same time. So ah, I was a bit, wow. it all done. So, so some of the tracks on the Nuts and Bolts are those two guys as well. They did yeah. a great job. But my question is, how did you feel about Nuts and Bolts as a game compared to Banjo 1 and 2, which were pretty much the same? Well, you know, I would have preferred to, I would have liked to see the proper Banjo Banjo three, that was right. what, I, what we wanted to do. And ironically, when when they first mentioned doing another banjo game, which is mm-hmm. quite a while after Banjo Tooie, mm-hmm. the, the original idea was to make it into a is to redo the first game but make it a co op. Oh, okay, really. Which we kind of thought that was a bit of a daft idea. And some of the senior guys who've been there a while, like me, sort of said we didn't like that idea. I mean, sort mm. of, they wanted us to kind of, you know, retext it all the levels and bring it up to date looking wise. And But the artist guys sort of said, you know, it, it, te- it would take just as long to build new levels as it will to, would be to texture the old levels. There's, there's no difference, really. Okay. Um, so uh, then, they went, then the, guys, the kind of designer guys went away and had a rethink. Mm. And they came back with the nuts and bolts thing. And it was kind of, it was loosely, but we just bought, well, Rare used to always make um, its own proprietary software. So, you know, anything we had, we made ourselves. We didn't buy anything in. No, there's no middleware. Right. Um, at this point, they bought in the Havoc physics engine, mm. uh, which, of course, it's all about, you know, bouncing blocks around and having real physics and all the rest of it and all, all calculated properly and all that stuff. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the factor that kind of went towards the building thing that they had the blocks in havoc and it was all going to react properly. And so that's what started it off. And that was it really, but like that was getting towards my, my end of time at rare. So I kind of lost contact with what went on really. I just, I, you know, it's sort of, I was doing, I did pinata and I was doing pinata too. And I was, you know, I'd sort of left nuts and bolts alone. So, you know, I just, I thought I'd have time to do it, you know, after I finished those two games, but mm-hmm. as it turned out, I was going to leave rare. So yeah, I had no time to do it really. So I sort of lost contact with it. I, I, I left before it was done as well. Yeah, and I feel like we should have a moment of silence for the memory of Rare. <laughs> I, know, it's very, I know, I must admit, it's, it never ceases to tug at my heartstrings because, you know, I absolutely, I loved being at Rare. It was, a, it was the yeah. best thing ever. And I mean, was. do you, do you, I mean, do you often come across people that, that will like sing the melodies back to you that you've written in these games back in the 90s? Yeah, that, honestly, it's really, really kind of humbling that is to think that, you know, that people still remember it all this time later. And I think mm-hmm. I've, you know, I've come to realize it's like recently, like things like, you know, I had like 2000 Twitter followers, something like that. And now I've got like 22,000 and it's, wow. it seems to be just the last couple of years that it's almost like all the, all the people that were like 10 or whatever back then have all, have all got, have all grown up now and they've all, they've all got their own Twitter accounts and they've found me at last. It just seems to be, it's a bit weird how it's kind of happened like that. And it's, you know, I think that I didn't understand it at first, but I think that thinking back now, if you're somehow part of somebody's childhood in, in whatever capacity, even mm-hmm. the tiniest bit, like I remember stuff from my, from my childhood right now, the, the, the kind of TV shows that I watched back then, you know, mm-hmm. right. I think that those things stay with you for all your life. I think, I think that I, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time with Banjo Kazooie for that generation. And they, you know, the kids, you know, what, between five and 10 or whatever it was back then and or however old they were, you know, those, those things stay with them forever. So it's, it's a really nice place for me to be and that people remember me. It's, it's really humbling to think that people remember it after all this time later. So it's, it's, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me that it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Dan remembers it every time he hears his phone because that's oh. his ringtone. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My, my ringtone is uh, the Wonder Wing uh, song from Banjo-Kazooie oh. when he gets the oh. gold feathers. I know the one, don't worry, I know. <laughs> it's yeah, so the awesome. main theme, I mean. And it's so cheerful. Yeah. It always gets me in a good mood. I'm like, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad to help you out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, wanted, I, w- I actually wanted to ask you a quick question. You know, speaking of all the, the music that you've done, you know, I mean, over the years, but, you know, I mean, especially the music that everyone knows from these games from, you know, the Nintendo 64 and all that. I mean, you had a lot of key modulations and you had a lot of really, I mean, great theory moments in the music. I mean, did you study theory or is this just something that you taught yourself? Well, I did study theory when I went to, you know, I did a music degree and I did 
study harmony, but I was really, really bad at it. Like, I, you know, be, you know, being a composer was not was, was the furthest thing from my mind. I just had no, that wasn't even on, in my head at all. Yeah. But like, but I think when I came to do Banjo Kazooie, you know, Tim Stamper, uh, who ran Rare, and Chris Stamper's brother, and Greg Mills, the lead designer there, they, you know, they were massive Nintendo fans, and you know, they used to harp on, they used to, you know really 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 put pressure on the music guys to make sure we tried to write a tune that was memorable but mm -hmm. didn't get on your nerves and all that kind of stuff and you know but I, when it came to Banjo Kazooie I wanted to just write something that was not that kind of very sweet sounding sort of Nintendo happy music mm -hmm. right I wanted to write something that was a bit more quirky because I felt like the characters were you know sort of um you know oddball characters and Kazoo was sarcastic and clever and Banjo was a bit dumb and you know <laughs> and all, you know and I, I wanted to try and reflect it in the music so all that kind of tritone back and forth that went on with the music was to try to reflect their personalities, you know? So okay. I wanted to try, to try to write something that I felt was different for the time. I mean, I don't know if it was or not, but I, that's what I, I endeavored to do. I tried to make it sound just different to most video games that you'd heard at the time. And as I say, it, it may not be, but in my mind, I felt like it was. Right. Um, and that's why probably people remember it still because it's something unique and something that, you know, well, as you say, I, it's, you know, childhood memories. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'd, I'd love to, th I'd love to think that. I just, I, I just don't really know. It's hard for me to, <laughs> to say but no i think that and i think because i was you know classically trained it does make you think more about chords and so you oh know i think maybe there's probably more to the harmony than most games had at the time but that was just because of you know sitting in sitting in school orchestras and stuff all your life and all that kind of stuff that you do when you you know playing at college and school that you do and you pick up things don't you i think i think that the most stuff that i've ever learned from writing music has been from listening to it rather than actually studying it all right well we're going to take a quick break to listen to a compilation of some of the songs that grant kirkhope did and you just may recognize a few of them. We'll be right back. any favorite songs of yours that you really like or are really proud of and some least favorite my favorite one of my own is, is called bedtime story it's from viva pinata 2 Ooh. okay it's a really kind of, it's, it's on my website actually it's a really kind of slow kind of you know tear jerker tune because it was like it was getting to my end of my time at rare and i knew i was going to be leaving it was very sad Aww. and um it was like that was the last tune that the orchestra recorded in in, in prague for those sessions and i had to the guy said, "Look, you should you should go out because I was sat in the control room listening to the orchestra play beautifully, and I had to I had to go out and sort of thank them at the end and say, you know, this is the last tune. Thank you very much, you know. Yeah, and I just, and I just burst into tears. <laughs> so it has to memories to it. Oh yeah, that tune of all my tunes. And there's that one. Another the one's called you know, what I called it Night Three. I, it was called something else at the end of the game. I, I didn't I didn't think of the game titles. They were done later. I left. Right. It was a, a piano one in Viva Pinata one. Mm -hmm. I can't think what it's, it might be called Tranquil Hours actually. Um, but um, th that one too. So, but bedtime story is the one that really I hate the titles because I, I didn't make the titles. Up, but that's the one that, <laughs> that, that, um, that is my ultimate favorite. It's probably my favorite of my, of my own of all time. Really, it's my best, the one that I like the best of all. So, right. So it was the people who were in charge of the games that named them, or so you just wrote the music. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the music. Yeah, yeah, for that. Yeah. But they, what I was, what I was, what they put the CD out sort of after I left the company. So oh. the design guy had to name all the tunes, and he just thought of bizarre sounding nighttime <laughs> i don't know what there's some you know they're called oven and blankets and weird things like that so i don't quite know where it came from but that um, was that was something i loved about like banjo kazooie and goldeneye especially with the soundtracks to that like the songs were just called what they where they appeared in the game <laughs> So yeah, so yeah it, was like, it makes it a lot easier to work out. Yeah, yeah, like I mean, this this song that plays outside of Mumbo Jumbo's hut in Banjo Kazooie was called "Outside of Mumbo Jumbo's Hut." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably, it probably was. That's right. Yeah, I think that you know when you're writing it, you don't think about having flashy titles. You just you know 
it's it all gets done later. So you know, all the pinata songs that I did were called like Day One, Day Two, Night Three. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So or Underwater in Banjo or something like that. You know, so I don't think it was. You don't think about things like that really. Right. right. And you, I mean, you said two of your favorites are from those games. Did you, I mean, did something about those games just really resonate with you? It just, I mean, it really just, it worked. Uh, Viva Pinata was the first time I got to use real orchestra. Oh, wow. oh okay. Yeah. So that was like a, a big deal for me that, you know, the Pinata was a big deal. And also it was kind of, I got to write music that I kind of like to listen to really. I'm, I'm a big sort of fan of like Elgar and Vaughan Williams and, you know, the Pinata games are really my kind of take you know, by no means I'm, I'm anywhere near as good as writing music as those guys, but um, it was my kind of attempt to be, have that kind of Englishy country garden sort of, you know, sound. Wow. And, you know, to go to the to Prague and hear them, people just, you know, kick off and play, it was incredible. It was just very, you know, it makes you, it's very tearful a moment that is, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I've been, uh, people always say to me, you know, what's your favourite game? And I, I must admit, I, I love all this. I've been very, very lucky that all the games that I've written for I really liked. Mm-hmm. That's you know, good. I've been, very, I've been very lucky that, you know, to get to write music for those games and all of them, right from now, right up to like, you know, Mickey Mouse last year and, and Kings of Zamalore. They were all great things to do. That's so wonderful. And I noticed, especially with the uh, Golden Eye was really, really popular. And how was that experience for you? That was really weird. I mean, like, you know, I, I joined Rare in uh, October 95. Mm-hmm. Um, and the work, the, I think the N64 was... It was, they were still doing SNES games there. They were still doing Donkey Kong 3 and the SNES. Mm-hmm. I think the N64 dev kits were there, so they're working on it. And Golden I was going on. And I, I, I joined in September, October, sorry. And then um, Graham Norgate, who was also a composer there, was doing, he was doing Golden Eye and Blast Core at the same time. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, you know, I'm a bit busy with Blast Core. Will you take over on Golden Eye? And I was like, of course, because I was doing like, <laughs> don- I, was, I was doing Donkey Kong 2 on, on the Game Boy at the time. It was mm-hmm. like, you know, not particularly exciting. <laughs> um, so I just started to do that. And, you know, to, to use the Bond theme was, was amazing. And, you know, it was great fun to do. And, you know, I listened to all the pop tunes that preceded all the movies and the soundtracks. And it was just a great, for, you, know, so, you know, for me to be on the door for 11, you know, be on the unemployment for 11 years and then turn up there and do that was incredible. You oh, know? my oh, yeah, God, absolutely. I can imagine. And I mean, how but, is... How is it working on, you know, I mean, different because obviously, you know, the way that people make music or like, you know, on the computer is so much different than it used to be. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, there was a program called Player Pro where you only got four tracks. That was it. And you had to type out, you know, like each note that you wanted. And I mean, there were guys that would be having like, you know, 12 to 15 instruments and they just go like you'd watch them in like a zigzag across all four tracks. I mean, how yeah. is it, how has it been for you? Like, what have been the differences in your writing styles based on the abilities of the programs? I've got to say, no, I don't, I don't think that the way I write music's changed at all from when okay. I first started. I just think that the kind of the tools you use get get better. I think right. that the you know the sample quality is better, and you know when I think back to you know squeezing music into Goldeneye, it was like you know we had to loop symbols because the decayer symbol was so long, you're like, you know, that when you hit it, it goes, goes tsh, it lasts for a long time, doesn't it? Like, you know, wow. that would take up to his memory. So we had to loop symbols. So it would go, we put an envelope, so it got, so it got quieter and quieter and quieter. Like, you know, it was appalling really, you know, when you think back what you used to do. I mean, I, I can't, you know, for me, it's like when people say, oh, golden eye sounds amazing. I always think, you know, are they, are they deaf? It's like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a bit like that. So, but you know, I think that sometimes it, there's, there's two sides of the coin to that. I think for people like me who are an audio people, you're constantly looking for that quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the pe- people that listen, sometimes they don't look, look for that quality. They don't really care. And if it just if they like the tune, they like the tune, they don't care what the quality is like. Right. right. And they, it's the same with movies. It's once you study something, you know the technique behind it, you care and you notice so much more about all the production, everything that goes into it. But the listeners, they haven't had that experience, so they don't know. So they just know, hey, it's Getty or it's oh, when Jimmy, I, or When I was a kid playing Banjo-Kazooie and Goldeneye and Donkey Kong, I was just thinking, dude, these songs are actually songs. <laughs> right. right. Like compared, compared to like some of the other games where it was just a looped like melody over and over again. Yeah, no, it, it's a bit weird. Like my, my, my wife would, would like quite happily put on a, an awful old cassette from the ages listening to Poison think it's great, you know, not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Not realise that it sounds awful. So I think that it, it, I try to remind myself, you know, whatever I do is to remember who you're making your music for. It's usually for a person sat in the bedroom playing the game and then, you know, that's the person you're making it for, not for your, your fellow audio peers. It's like, it's for the person that, that parts with their hard-earned cash for that game or that movie or whatever, it, or CD, whatever it may be that, 
you know, you've got to think about what's good for them, what's what's good for you, you know. So, and I want to, you know, I want to know in terms of those. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm referencing all the the old games you did, but those are the <laughs> ones that I'm really I'm really curious about how you did some of the stuff. I mean, with with you know all those old you know rare games, you I noticed that a lot of the music was or parts of it was based around the sound effects that were happening in the games. When you were working on these, did the developers tell you what was going on in the game or did you just kind of have to guess what it would play and hope that the sound effects would work? Uh, well, the, thing, the, the sound effects are all actually in the piece. They're timed in the piece exactly. Okay. So they, weren't, they weren't a separate engine. They were like all inside. So like, say like Click Clock Woods in Banter Kazooie, it's got like little birds that tweet in time mm-hmm. with the music. Mm-hmm. Um, so because it was all MIDI based back then, it wasn't like, you know, it was a MIDI. Was a, what happened was you would get your samples, like a violin or a whatever it was, and you'd, you'd put it into the N64. Right. And then, then you'd have a MIDI file that would play those sounds. So you made it, you don't, you, you kind of made your own little mini sound set that would sit in memory in the N64. Mm-hmm. And then the MIDI file would trigger it and kind of thing. So, so I could put, I could put bird sounds physically in the, my little, in my little MIDI orchestra, like that was inside the box. And then, just the MIDI file would trigger them, so I could get the, the sounds to trigger exactly at the right time I wanted to be, and I could, okay. they could, see, they could tweet tunes. And so MIDI isn't really used anymore. It's all proper CD soundtracks now, or DVD soundtracks. It's real musical, you know, real streams, stereo mm-hmm. streams. And um, so that's great, but you know, you've, we've kind of lost that interactivity. It's harder to make stereo streams interactive. So with Banjo Kazooie, like all those kind of changes that happen between the when you went underwater or went to a new area, and it always seamlessly like morphing to the next bit. That was easy in media, but it's quite it's hard these days. It's, it requires quite a lot more thought about it. But yeah. the MIDI times, when it was on MIDI, it was, it was way easier. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, I, I got that idea really. For, it wasn't my idea. It was from the, um, I played all the early LucasArts games like Monkey Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and they had that, that, that thing called the iMU system, which were like, they did that thing where they faded the music and it used to, it used to always fade to different things depending on where you were in the game. And I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so, we just kind of worked our own, our own little way to do it and then did it our own little way. But um, yeah, that's where it came from. But I, I thought it was a fantastic feature to be able to use it. You could kind of, you had to fade, you could fade things to different levels. But it was hard because there's only 16 channels in a MIDI file. So you, you had like 16 things you could you could do. So I'd have to, I'd have to say, like Mumbo's Mountain had like maybe four or five areas. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to, I, you know, I had to kind of choose like three channels for that area, two channels for that area, four channels for that area. And I, it was like that. So it was you had to be quite economical to try and work out what you needed to, you know, to what you know some areas would require more instruments, some some areas required less, and there was always like an underwater section that required a harp, you know. So it was tricky to get it right. Right. So I mean, now when when you get these these projects and they tell you, you know, that you're going to write the music for it with you know any game that you work on, you know, no matter when it was made, so they tell you what kind of a scene it is. Or do you? I mean, do you get actually get to see this scene that you're working on? Or the characters, right? Or the characters. Yeah, sometimes I think, but I mean, I think, you know, any composer kind of worth the salt, you know, if someone says, okay, we've got like a a, 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 a frozen ice forest, mm-hmm. you know, my mind's thinking Celeste, you know, pixie strings, triangles, glockenspiel, exactly. you know what I mean? You start thinking, your mind starts buzzing away already. So I think that a lot of the time you don't actually really need to see something unless it was something like a, obviously a cutscene, you need to do that right because it's like a movie, it needs to be, it needs to be exact every time. Yeah. But when it's a kind of a, you know, we need some ambient pieces for a forest or a, or a cave or, you know, you, you know, you're going to get a pretty good idea of any, well, I think most composers would get a pretty good idea of what's going to sound like before they even start, or at mm-hmm. least it's the kind of instrumentation or the, how it's going to, what's going to, the kind of general sound of it all, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Now, what has been your biggest challenge so far? Um, I think when I did that game, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, that a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was the first time I'd done something on such a large scale. It was a very, it was a kind of hundred piece orchestra. It was a big, a, wow. a, a big size. And it was like, there's the big boss battles there were like, really, I wanted to try and make it as big as I could make it. You know, I wanted right. to, cause I, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge admirer of John Williams and, you know, I think that I love the way he writes his music and exactly. um, I, I was trying to kind of, on my own little way, kind of emulate that fantastic thing that he does. Mm-hmm. So I spent, I did spend an awful lot of time listening to the to the um, the first three Harry Potter soundtracks because they were the ones that he wrote. He didn't write the rest; just the first three. Okay. Nice. And I kind of the big action pieces, like the Quidditch matches and the that kind of stuff. Uh, that was the stuff that I listened to most of all because I liked the way that he had. I mean, John Williams is great at having that. He's sort of known for being like having that great big tune that comes in that everyone knows, like Darth Vader's tune or whatever. You know, right. everyone knows that stuff. But people don't notice the stuff that's in between that. Mm-hmm. And oh, I, yeah. I, I, I kind of call it his kind of his sort of tread water music where he's the big moment will come, the big tune, and then they'll go back to this kind of really energetic, 
tons of ideas in a short period of time, just just going just just like all over the place. Right. Like, and I loved the way he did that. It was so it, it, like it was because because it was so ran, not random because it was so non-intrusive it would it would keep the the action the level really high you'd be really excited but you weren't mm-hmm. getting blocked out by a big tube that was kind of distracting you right and then when the next moment happened with the big tube would, would come in it'd be a real great moment so i tried to my own little way to the, 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 all the boss pieces in reckoning all hopefully sound something like that i mean obviously no one here is good as that but that was the there's, there's like the one called tear knock the dragon and gadflow was a, a, a kind of a wizard guy and so all that kind of stuff was designed to be like that you know big tune moments then then interspersed with kind of lots of really fast paced you know exciting music that was like all over the place right so they, 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 those those boss pieces were the kind of the hardest of, well, not the hardest of work but uh, they, were, they were they were quite difficult to do you know and i really enjoyed kind of picking up on the way he does things and try to get that into, into my own music so that was really enjoyable and i'd say they were the hardest the hardest things i've written so far probably well speaking of challenges we actually have a new challenge for you today because right. we are up to our segment, the question of the week. So in this segment, we'll ask our interviewees a new question every week, and they have to think of the funniest answer that they can come up with. To our oh, listeners, God. write in your questions on our Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainment drive through and our Twitter at eDrive through, and we just might use it as the question of the week. Now, Grant, are you ready? I am. I did do a quick call. Can I take my time? Oh, you can take your time. Yeah. All right. right. (laughs) There's there's no hourglass. You're good. So. All right. All right. So question is, what do you think is one of the funniest job titles or jobs? Oh, God. That's a hard one. (laughs) Uh, Oh, that's dreadful. I can't can't think of anything. Um, Without being overly rude. Um. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, keeper of the Royal Privy. <laughs> keeper of the Royal Privy. <laughs> nice. That's probably quite good. I, you know. It sounds quite grand for someone, someone who keeps a toilet clean. Yeah. It's quite grand type. Yeah. I, I, I'm just like imagining some janitor just taking that title, you know, because all the kids at the high school are just picking on him. And he's like, you know what? I am the grand keeper of the Privy. <laughs> And they just go, <laughs> yeah. Or the Royal That's Flusher. True. That's right, the Royal Flusher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the That's Royal. Yeah, it's like those guys that hang out in the bathrooms. Like, the, what are they? The toilet attendees, or is that, or the the lavatory attendees, or whatever their job is called, where they they put the soap in your hand. Mm-hmm. I know you, that is really, that's so strange. That way. in the UK <laughs> did that didn't happen. It the first time I came to America and did that, I thought, I thought there's some funny guy stood in the corner. What's he doing? You know, he's like, you're like <laughs> watching or something, you know, a bit peculiar. We didn't quite, uh, all of a sudden these guys were like, what's that bloke doing over there? What's he doing? You know, so that's a bit strange. That's always how I know I'm at a fancy restaurant or like really that costs a lot yeah. of money when you have <laughs> that. True. Like I get it in a hotel room or something like, but but when it's in a random restaurant, I'm like, really? But could really? you imagine, you know, you like you just finish, you know, you are like <laughs> for, so for, no, for a guy, like they just finished at the urinal. They're about to flush and this guy runs in. Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry. I got that. Royal Flusher. <laughs> I know. It's, it's and really, I have a badge, really Royal Flusher. Yeah. And, yeah. The, yeah. and then he just goes, I'm the Royal Flusher. This is my job. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> yeah, but, but I suppose the keeper, they're all pretty, probably got a very, a very posh outfit to wear. He's got like, you know, coat of arms and a hat. That's the <laughs> sad part. They probably have fancier outfits than we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably, that's where all the money goes to, just their outfits to look pretty. I know, exactly. That's a weird one. Yeah, so I, I reckon that's a, that's a reasonably strange job title. Probably quite funny, I suppose. <laughs> I, like <laughs> I, like, I like that. Well, anyway, getting back to the interview, but that was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wanted, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, I noticed that, you know, in some of the old rare games, you actually did some of the voices as well as the music. I did. Yes, that's right. How did that come around? I mean, did they run out of people that that had unique voices or they just saw you and were like, would you like to be a part of it? I mean, it seems it seems like those old games, I mean, kind of the way that you describe it. And I mean, all of the passion, I mean, that that was around that company. It, it seems like it was more of of a family and a community as opposed to just an office. Oh yeah, definitely. It was because it, it, I mean, the, the Stamper family who, who ran it, they were like you know, it's Tim and Chris and Steve and the brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim's wife worked there. Tim's Tim and Chris's and, and Stephen's uh, sister worked there. The mum and dad worked there. It was all Stampers, you know. That it was a completely family run thing, and it, was, it made everyone feel so welcome. Right. It was a 
fantastic thing. But the voice thing was that Rare was a very kind of security conscious thing. It was the Stamper people are the very, the very private people. So you never hear about them in the news ever. They're just very quiet people. They, they always, they didn't like doing interviews. That's why they, in those days there was never any inter- interviews with staff because the Rare people used to say, you know, we're not pop stars. We're making games. We don't need to do interviews. Like the games do the talking and you ah. just keep and get on with it so Aww. that's why there's very few interviews from back then but the the voice thing was like that's a, that was partly due to saying well they wouldn't get anybody from the outside to do a voice because that meant they came to the company they'd see the games early they could right. talk about oh, okay so it kind of just it really just came down to the fact that i just used to do it because nobody else would that, <laughs> like, but literally, that, that did, was it literally like you know how, I, I did, how did you think of the voice they were like did you look at the character and like hmm and just, like he just looked at a blue character and was like <laughs> yeah, I know, well, yeah i mean you know i think that I mean, like, there was a guy there called Chris Sutherland. He he voiced Banjo and Kazooie. Uh-huh. He, did, he did quite a lot of voices. I mean, I did like Mumbo, and um, you know. Um, but I think you just we we all had our own little little funny voices that everyone knew we did this kind of voice, you know. So Mumbo was just me going like, um, "Eat come bulk up, eat come bulk up." You know, I did that, <laughs> and then I just I just take, and then I just reduced it in pitch. And Mumbo had a chant that was like. Um, in the background of the second game in the first level, the Aztec, well, not Aztec, uh, Mayhem Temple. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. There's a chant in that. I, I, I've told the story before, but it's like, it's a chant that you can't quite work out what he's saying. <laughs> it's a bit of a long story, this, but it, I used to, when, for the first game, we decided Mumbo should have a, like a chant, mm-hmm. or he should say something when he did a spell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a British saying that goes, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. It's like a thing that these chant in football matches. <laughs> You know, to uh, to fight the other the other fans. Oh no! So I did that. So I did this. Come one up, up ball. It you think you're at it? Oh, did it like that in <laughs> and load it in pitch. But then it did, it ended up getting scrapped from the first game. Oh. Sorry, it ended, up, it ended up no, it ended up getting into that tune for Mayhem Mayhem Temple, which because it was going to be in the first game. Mm-hmm. Right. Then did it got put got put to the second game, so it didn't get used. And then when it came to Mumbo doing his Ekan Bokum thing, his little dance, <laughs> I I cut those symbols those. It up, I just cut the come on ab at go into sim- into single samples. Okay, and, and I, lo- I loaded them onto a keyboard and just played them in any any random order. And I found I can make it say ekum bokum ekum bokum. That's what it's just, it is. There's those syllables in the wrong order. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I like Umi Naka. That's his, that, that's a bit of a. I can't really tell that story. It's a bit of a rude story. That one. <laughs> uh, so you know, there's that, yeah. So like, I like I did DK. I did I did him as well, and DK sixty four because just because no one else was going to do it, so I just did it. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm glad though that you brought up that chant though because I've always had my theories about what <laughs> he, about what you said because right. I mean it sounds like you say Ekum Bokum eat your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I know, yeah. Cause I, 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 you know, when I got those sort of so many syllables um, together, I, I tried to play it in different order to see what I, get, what I could get it to say. And it's funny how you can get the rearranged stuff. Yeah. To me, it sounded like Ekan Bokum, Ekan Bokum, Ekan Bokum in your ass. That's what, that's what, that's what, <laughs> that's what Oh my like, God. It sounded like ass to me. Ekan Bokum in your ass. That's what I thought it sounded like. <laughs> that's not true. There's a whole video series of how Benji Kasui is totally dirty. Oh, it- that is such yeah. that is such a not for kids game. No, it's it so really funny. Isn't. I, I didn't like it was how how do you feel about them when you see that like you're like damn. <laughs> so there was so yeah there was so many things in the rare games that people didn't spot. I mean yeah, you know, the, the whole thing was just trying to get it past Nintendo without them realizing it. Um, <laughs> so we did that. We did tons of stuff in there. There's I mean people have found most of the things by now, but there's still a few things they haven't found that we put in the game. And there's My something. God. Well. I did. There's a game called Grab by the Ghoulies. I don't know if you know. I did that game. Uh, uh-huh. It's this game on the Xbox. And um, there's a there's a mummy in it who, who's got that one of those anks, the A N K H. That the, the big symbols. They use that as a as a a, a, a weapon to hit people with. Mm-hmm. Um, so they go anka ank anka as they, as they used it. Mm-hmm. But I changed it so when they put picked it up in the air, they go whoa like that uh-huh. whoa anka. So like, when oh. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when you get like six mummies in the room, they all go wanker, wanker. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was hilarious. Um, bravo, bravo, yeah, that's, that's yeah, brilliant. So you didn't spot it with just this, this, this one mummy. When there's lots of mummies together, because they're all saying the same thing together, you get lots of wankers going on. I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> So there's tons of stuff like that all over the have, place. Have you gotten away with, because there are certain words that are more British than American. Do you think you yeah. can get away with more because you're like, oh, you know, some words that they don't know. I know. But there's that bit in Banjo Kazooie when, when the, in the graveyard in, in um, Bad Monster Mansion, mm-hmm. when Kazooie has to spit an egg into the pot. Yeah. 
I'm, you know, and the voice says, thank you. And it's me saying thank you. And I just pitched it down. Right. But, but Nintendo thought for so long I was saying F you. you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, and that's that's the big, one of those big like mysteries is no one knows what they're saying. And it's like if you play it over and over again, you hear both of them. I know. And it's, <laughs> it really was. I genuinely were, was saying thank you. I didn't ever think about making that because that's such an obvious word. I couldn't use that word. Right. <laughs> But like I had to go to such lengths to try and convince them that I was just saying thank you, I, I, you know, and they wouldn't believe me. And they said, "Oh, you're, you're swearing." I said, "You know, for God's sake, I, I wouldn't put that word in a kids' game. I mean, <laughs> there's other things in there, but not that one for God's, you know." And I, um, ha- I actually have to ask you a quick question about Banjo Kazooie. That anyone who's listening to this, who was a Banjo Kazooie fan like me, is probably wanting to know this: What the hell was with Stop and Swap? Oh God, I can't believe that. <laughs> for those for those listening in who don't know about this, Stop and Swap was the most infuriating thing of like Banjo Kazooie fans' childhoods or anyone that played it because it was a wild goose chase. They told you in the first one, you get these secret eggs, and then you like randomly like pull out the cartridge and put in Banjo Tooie when it comes out and you get it in the second one. But that didn't work. It just froze the game. No. And then in the second one, they tried new stuff and they said it'll be used in the third one. But then they made nuts and bolts. <laughs> I think the thing, what happened was we fa- we found that when you took a cartridge out of the N64, mm-hmm. the RAM would still hold the information for about 10 to 12 seconds. Mm-hmm. Oh. So we realized that we can make games communicate with each other. So if we got the cartridge out fast enough and the next one in fast enough, you could connect the game somehow. So we could, we could like, the, the plan actually was originally was to, was to connect Banjo-Kazooie to Don- Donkey Kong 64. Yeah. yeah. And that was the original plan to try and get some things you got, special things could tr- transfer to the next game, you see. So uh. it, it all worked. But the problem was that Nintendo's wouldn't let us do it because they, you know, you might get some young kid that pulls out the cartridge, rams the next cartridge and then breaks the machine, you know, so yeah. they, they, could get, they could get sued for it. So it was, it was just down to a legal thing, but it all completely worked. But we had to remove it because the, but the graphics were still there. So of course people find us that stuff. So, um, but that, that's what it was. And we found that the, the, the machine would, would retain the information for about 10 to 12 seconds and we could transfer information that way. It was a great idea and it would have been great to have it, but you just, you got that thing where, people break the machine or break the cartridge or snap the ROM or something like that. And then they'd be suing Nintendo because, you know, they'd just broken the, you know, they did what they were told to do. They broke it, you know. Damn so. America. I'm sorry. Like in Europe, you're just an asshole. Like you don't <laughs> sue the company. I'm sorry. I'm from Iceland. I like, how, I like how you guys from Iceland, it's like you literally just don't care. If someone does something stupid, well, they're stupid. Yeah, they're stupid. Yeah. You're just like, you don't go and sue the company. You're just like, you are stupid. Like, just don't do that again. Or like, <laughs> or you pay for it or something. Or, getting, or you know, bad kid, go in the corner, cry about it. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that was, it was a shame, really, because it was going to work. It was going to be great. So, um, but we just couldn't do it because of that, for that reason. So, but I mean, the story's been, for years, that people made up such amazing, fantastical stories about what the, what it really was there for, but that that's the truth. That's what happened. I gotcha. And also, you know, I mean, I've also noticed that you know, with these games, I mean, you said the original intent. I mean, and I, I I've read about this before. You know, was that it was supposed to be a link to from Banjo to Donkey Kong. I mean, and I noticed that in all those games, I mean, you had there were references pretty much to all of them in each of the games. I mean, what was the thing there? Just like I think that um, you know. Rare was a place that we, we all used to. Everyone was a it was friendly. Everyone, you know, everyone together. You know, even though, even though the teams were kept very separate, mm-hmm. um, you know, when we were working. But you know, it was a big camaraderie, a big brotherhood, like there. You know, so everyone just tried to help everybody out, and like it was a kind of a commons kind of sense of humor. Like, you know, George Andreas, who was on Banjo Kazooie as a kind of junior designer, ended up becoming the senior design, the, the league designer on Donkey Kong sixty four. So he had the that kind of Banjo Kazooie sort of um, sense of humor already. So. You know, all that kind of stuff just carries across. You know, there was a real, you know, some. It's like when the stars align. You know, you get a bunch of people who've all got this, this kind of same kind of wacky sense of humor, and it just it just permeated through all the games. You know, so it was just one of those fortunate events, really. So yeah, it was just, yeah. Now I'm curious because uh, you've been in the business for quite a, quite a while, and I was wondering, you've seen a lot of changes. Has it been hard to transfer between companies and all that stuff, like to keep the career as a as a for a, a soundtrack for games going or um, uh, well, I don't know really. I think that you know, leaving Rare was was awful. I, I mean, I didn't I didn't want to go, but I, I knew I had to because it was it was just wasn't working anymore for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so going to Big Q's Games in Baltimore was was um it was traumatic, but it was you know to come to a new country and all that was great fun, and we liked that we love America. You know, we, we always wanted to give it a try. So 
you, you just make friends, don't you? I think that, you know, as an audio guy, you, you, you generally get to talk to everybody because everybody, you know, you do stuff for everyone, don't you? Right. You know, you and, for everybody, so. and that seems to be the thing, what I've noticed with you guys is that it's all about connections. You get job depending on who you know and who knows of you, right? Oh, yeah. I t- I, I, I'm funny, I met a young composer today, actually, for, for lunch today. Um, and I was telling him that, that you know, that it's it's 50% talent, 50% networking you have you know that you know all the work that i've got recently has come from someone that i've known from somewhere else right you know? oh, yeah and where and do you some- go to network or where do you meet those people well that's a, that's i'm still learning that really i think right. you know, I'm, I'm quite new to la so i'm still learning learning that kind of routine but i think that um you know i'm a member of bafta so i, I, I go to their stuff and i'm a member of the scl that's the society for composers and lyricists mm-hmm. um you know, they're, they're two big bodies in, here in LA. But I think that um, some, even though, I mean, Big Cheese Games actually physically went bust because Kurt Schilling owned the company, it all went down the, down the tubes, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a way, that company going bust has been a great thing because they've all gone to separate companies. Exactly. And I, you know, and, the, and, this, and if they like you, they recommend you to, for, the, for the next job, you know. So I've just done some music for something that I can't speak about, unfortunately. Right. But um, it was it took a couple of guys that were at Big Cheese Games that went somewhere else and, and then they called me and said, look, you know, we need some music, dude, we'd, we'd love to have you do it. And so hmm. that was great for me. You know, it's, it's all that connection and stuff. It's fantastic. Right. Now, what about resources? Do you use any, like, website that you really like to see for – or getting gigs or – no, I've never done that. No, it's always, it's always generally been through people giving me a call. I think nice. that, you know, and, and like, as I said before, it is a bit weird now because I'm, I'm sort of in this kind of, this sweet spot just happened the last couple of right. years. <laughs> it is just about, I'm sure like all these kids who are now 20 something, all right, they're doing indie games. So, you know, I've done some indie games now for people that have like done Kickstarters. Like I'm doing, I'm doing Hex Heroes right now right. Uh, for and a guy who is a big Banjo Kazooie fan. Hmm. Another game that I'm doing now that I can't talk about, unfortunately, but is is, is like he's also a massive Banjo Kazooie fan, you know. And like I did, I did that game, I had in time because they were huge Banjo Kazooie fans. How you know? amazing so, is that to have such yeah, a thing? Yeah, it, it is. I think that I've just I've had to wait 20 years for it, mind you. <laughs> See, I'm I'm just glad that I'm not the only huge Banjo Kazooie <laughs> fan out there. <laughs> I know. I must. I mean, you know, I'm so toyed with the idea of trying to put something together for that, and I, you know, we have, I, yeah, I just. It's hard to know if there really is a market out there for a new Banjo Kazooie game. You know, it's hard to know that. I mean, you know, yeah. I know, I, I know I've got like, I've got twenty two thousand followers on Twitter, but that's not enough. You know, I know. Right. You know, you, you you need to have. I just don't know if the, if the audience is there. It looks like it is, but and if Microsoft would ever think about doing it, I mean, they own the characters. They could get they could in the same way that somebody just did Killer Instinct. They could farm out the characters to somebody else because I don't think Ray could do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And they could, somebody could do a game for that. It's possible, just whether they think the market's there. I don't think they do. Yeah, because I was gonna, I was gonna say. I mean, it just. I, I mean, I've been hearing a lot. You know, like for the past few years, I've been looking. You know, is it going to happen? And I know there were like you know images leaked supposedly, and I know that there was there were like ideas of something like uh, Banjo Kazooie Grunty's World or Grunty's Island. I don't know something yeah, like that. That was a hoax. That was a hoax. That was. I thought so. <laughs> yeah, yeah hugs. I, I don't. I don't think. I mean, Rare have been working on Connect Sports for the last four, five, six years. So, and they just finished the last one now. So, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do next. I would. I would. I would doubt it was Banjo Kazooie. Microsoft, you know, own the IP. Mm-hmm. You know, as I say, in the same way that they let they let um, Double Helix do um, Killer Instinct, they could they could certainly, you know, give Banjo Kazooie to another company. Whether they do a good job or not, I don't know. But it's completely possible. They could do what they like with it. They own it. I right. get the why would they would want like the today's kids are becoming grown ups and you know um parents themselves so they probably want to play it with their kids. That's why I loved when I see uh when I see kids like playing with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because I loved that when I was little. So yeah. it must be so nice for them to play with them. So I think that's probably why you're seeing a lot of interest in it because also because those people are so frustrated with their life and they're like I want to be a child <laughs> again and play uh, Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, I mean it's nice that that Max have released. Banjo Kazooie, Banjo Tui on the uh, XBLA, the, the, you know, the, the, you can get it on there mm-hmm. and play it on the Xbox. And my son, you know, has played those games backwards, you know, you know, Aww. right away through because he because he, he loves it. And like, you know, it's quite interesting for me to sort of. I didn't tell him that I did that I've worked on the game. I just said, you know, here's a game I think you might like playing to see what he thought mm-hmm. about. He's, right. he's a twelve year old kid, right? So you know, he's used to the modern games that have come out now. But he absolutely adored it, and he, in fact, Aww. he actually loves he loves nuts and bolts as well, actually. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, it proves that there's appeal in those games. I think that. I don't know. I think in my heart, I sort of think that a new Banjo Kazooie could be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, it just has to be done right. That's all. He has to have that original humor. I think. It, I think they need to do a game in the style of the first game. You know, 
and I've got a brilliant idea for a plot that I think could that would uh, cancel out nuts and bolts. I've just got I've got it in my head right now. <laughs> well, if you ever want someone to help work on that, I am more than happy. Exactly. Put it on <laughs> Kickstarter. Maybe you can be like the Reading Rainbows, right? You guys, as long as you get the license and all that. But yeah. I was gonna say, you know what I think was so. I mean, so gravitating about Banjo-Kazooie to people. And I mean, this was one of the reasons why it, I mean, it's my personal favorite game I've ever played. And I think one of the reasons why is the fact that no matter what mood you're in, if you play that game, you're gonna have a smile on your face. (laughs) It was so goofy. I mean, the plot was great. It was fun. It was adventurous. It was exciting. The other thing is if you play through that game, it's one of those unique games where you really play through every style of adventure because, you you know, you've got the really, you know, like happy, cheerful spiral mountain. You end up in Mad Monster Mansion, which is like the Halloween, like horror theme. And then you've got, you know, Treasure Trove Cove, which is the big, you know, pirate scene. I mean, it really captured it all. Yeah, I think that. You know, it, it, it's it's just a great. It's one of those just one of those great games, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, I was it was a privilege to work on it, and you know, at the time we didn't know if we could be you know how good it was going to be at the time. It's just one of the things you do, you know. Um, and we were late getting it done, and we thought it was going to miss going to miss it all, and people are going to hate it, and you know, so it's just uh, it's, you never know really, do you? It's just it's look of the draw, really. So I think that was like a a really great time, and I, you know, I think that. You know, I've considered the Kickstarter thing. I think that's possible because, like, you know, you can raise a lot of money on Kickstarter with a few people. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't need to have the millions of people subscribed to it. There's plenty of games I've got. I've raised, you know, a lot of money mm-hmm. from like twenty, thirty thousand people. You know, right. for, for all of those people put in ten books. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of money. You know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's sort of getting the money up front instead of you know. That, yeah. That's why I thought like. Why not? Kick, because, yeah, the Reading Rainbow and all these different, like, these childhood things are coming up through Kickstarter because people truly love it. And as soon as they hear that it's about to come, dedicated fans will, you know, want to support it. Well, I mean, Reading Rainbow is doing pretty well because of the whole yeah. idea that, you know, the schools want it back as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's true. But, but I, I mean, but, it, you're right. You're absolutely but, right, though. I mean, it's the market, you know, I mean, in there. There really are that many, you know, fans of everything out there. That- I think so, because I, even, like, with Veronica Mars, the movie, like, they were dedicated to Veronica Mars people for, like, years, and I think with Benji Kasui, it's a game that everybody loved, and, yeah, I think so. They're finally working, people. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, when, I, when we first talked to you about being on the show, I made, I made a Facebook post to ask if any of my friends had questions to ask you, because right. I knew that I knew that at least one of my friends would pop on and and say and my brother is a huge fan as well and I knew he was going to make a comment and about twenty of my friends instantly swarmed that post. Right. I mean that's I mean that game really made I mean all the games that you worked on I mean they made a huge impact on people. Uh, it is that childhood thing. I think if you catch people at the right age, they remember it forever. I think mm-hmm. that you know, I'm the same. I, you know, I've got TV shows that I like when I was a kid and that you never forget and. I think it's just part of that thing that, you know, I get so many emails from people now saying, you know, the childhood thing's a big deal. And, you know, I, I do get the odd touching email where people have had awful childhoods and the game was anything that made them smile. You know, yeah. it's really, you know, it's, it's been, I've had some really genuinely sad things that, you know, bring a tear to your eye that is, you know, and to think that in some way you help that kid out is, is amazing, you know, and even in the tiniest part. And the other part of it, that is that you might get some kids who, I decided to become composers because I like the music so much. You oh, know? Yeah. Like that's like really fantastic to think that you could have influenced someone to do that thing. And even in the smallest, you know, tiniest part of their lives, you could just put a, a seed in there that they want to do something. I think that's incredible. I just think that's the, that's the best thing ever, you know, it really is. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I hate to say this, but we are down to the end of the interview, no. but <laughs> where are places that our listeners can find out more information about you and the work that you do? Well, I've got grantkirkhope.com, of course, that's my main website. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's I've, it's kind of two halves, so people get a bit confused. When you go to the website, there's a, there's a play you can click on. It's got like a, a set number of pieces. That's my kind of bit where I kind of say what I can do, and people can you know if people try and employ me. Mm-hmm. But underneath the play, there's a button that says for the diehards. If you click on that, it goes through to the second website, which is just full of all the stuff that I did in the past, like everything just chucked in there. Like so, it's a it's a real place to dig around and find out what you can find. Mm-hmm. And there's some bands because we beat the tracks on there, things like that that people haven't heard before. Nice. Also, I've got Twitter, of course, at Grant Coco. I've got Grant Coco on Facebook. But also, I've got a, a Grant Coco Bandcamp uh, page, and that's got quite a lot of the soundtracks on there for free. And um, also, um, I've, it's got like a banjo because we beta tracks as well on there, which has got lots of just, it's not very, very perfect, but it's, it's tons of stuff that I wrote when I was trying to write music that you can sort of, 
hear where I got the ideas from. So those things are quite interesting to listen to, you know, so. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Grant, for being on the show. It's really been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. No, thank you for asking me. Um, it's nice to be wanted. Yes. <laughs> And for more information on Grant Kirkhope and the podcast, go to entertainmentdrivethrough.com and subscribe on iTunes. Like and follow us on our Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainmentdrivethrough and our Twitter and Instagram at yedrivethrough. Hello, this is Grant Kirkhope and you're listening to Entertainment Drive Through.